Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a tidbit about the difference between Armageddon and the apocalypse, a meaty middle about numbers and style guides, and a familect story. But first, a correction. In the podcast last week on autological words, we said that a diphthong is a combination of consonants that creates a new sound. Actually, diphthongs are combinations of vowels that do so, such as combining O and I to create O-I, as in choice. We regret the error. And now, on to Armageddon. The past couple of weeks, we've been watching a new series on Amazon Prime called Good Omens. It's based on a book written by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Gaiman is a fiction and film author who came up with the Sandman series of comic books. Pratchett is a fantasy author who's best known for his 41-book Discworld series. Good Omens tells the story of an angel and a devil who band together to try to stop the end of the world, also known as Armageddon. And that got us thinking, what exactly does Armageddon mean? Is it the same thing as the apocalypse? And why is the first word capitalized, but the second one isn't? Well, the word Armageddon comes from Christianity. It refers to the final battle between good and evil, when the kings of the earth, under the leadership of demons, are supposed to wage war on the forces of good. According to the Bible, in Revelation 16.16, this giant battle is supposed to occur, quote, in a place called in the Hebrew language Armageddon, unquote. That probably refers to the real-life town of Megiddo in northern Israel. Back in the day, Megiddo was an important town. It lay at the crossing of two military and trade routes right between Egypt and Syria. It had been the scene of many important battles, and for this reason it may have been chosen as the logical place for the final battle. As for how Megiddo became Armageddon, in Hebrew, the prefix har means hill, and thus har Megiddo became Armageddon. The Oxford English Dictionary shows that it was actually written as Hermageddon in what is known as the Wycliffe Bible or Wycliffeite Bible, an early English translation from Latin published in the 1380s associated with the English priest and activist John Wycliffe. So are Armageddon and the Apocalypse the same thing? Well, they have different derivations, but they've come to have similar meanings. Apocalypse comes from a Greek word meaning to uncover or to reveal. In the original biblical sense, an apocalypse was a revelation, the prophecy of cataclysmic events. In fact, the biblical book of Revelation is sometimes also known as the Apocalypse of John because it describes John's visions of the end of the world. The battle at Armageddon is actually one of the events included in the apocalypse. One of the events John mentions in Revelation. So in the biblical sense, Armageddon is kind of a subset of the apocalypse. In common use, though, we now use the word apocalypse, or the adjective apocalyptic, to refer to any disaster that would result in dramatic, irreversible damage to humanity or the environment. For example, diplomats are working to avoid a nuclear apocalypse. Or, we took to the hills after the zombie apocalypse. Armageddon has a nearly identical meaning, any catastrophe that would likely destroy the human race or the entire world, but technically it's best used to describe something like a specific conflict or battle. For example, if they don't reach a nuclear accord, it could start Armageddon. Or, zombies surrounded the building and our team went out to fight them off. It's Armageddon out there. A couple of tiny notes about spelling. When you're writing these words, remember that Armageddon has one G and two Ds. Those are easy to reverse. Maybe you can remember by thinking that Armageddon is the battle at the end and the double letter comes at the end. And remember that Armageddon is capitalized, but Apocalypse isn't. That's because Armageddon is a proper noun referring to one specific battle. In contrast, there could be many apocalypses. Let's just hope there aren't, especially the zombie kind. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as DragonflyEdit. 
Before we get to numbers and style guides, today's episode is supported by the bra people are talking about. The original True Body Bra by TrueAndCo.com. It took more than six years of collecting data from 7 million people to make this game-changing bra. It looks amazing on all body types because the buttery soft fabric smooths you out in all the right places. The best-selling True Body collection now comes in more than 70 wire-free options. Choose from scoop or v-neck, convertible straps, bright colors, neutrals, skin tones, and more. You'll want them all. The Today Show calls it game-changing. Good Housekeeping says it's the ultimate lounge bra. And Real Simple Magazine says it provides heavenly 24-hour comfort. Join more than half a million happy customers. Try the original True Body bra from True & Co. today with free and easy returns. And save 15% now when you go to trueandco.com slash grammar and enter the code grammar. That's T-R-U-E-A-N-D-C-O dot com. Today's show is also sponsored by an innovative financial firm called Aspiration. Aspiration doesn't want to be like the big banks, where high fees are common and your deposits could be used to help the bank invest in oil pipelines and other unsustainable practices. With Aspiration, you get more money in your pocket and more power to do good. They offer a 2% annual percentage yield, zero ATM fees anywhere in the world, and the option to choose your own monthly fee, even if it's zero. Plus, 10% of Aspiration's earnings go to charity, and they give you cashback rewards for shopping at socially conscious businesses. That's why Aspiration's been featured in Forbes, The New York Times, and Money Magazine. Everyone deserves a financial firm that helps you make money while making a difference. Put your money where your heart is. Download the Aspiration app to open an account, earn 2% annual interest, pay zero ATM fees, and save the planet while you're at it. Aspiration. Download the app today. Last week, I had lunch with a friend who has a new book coming out. She's at the stage where her publisher is copy editing her final manuscript, and she told me about a problem she's been having that I think holds some valuable lessons. We'll call my friend Helen. Helen disagrees with her publisher about how some of the numbers should be handled in the manuscript. And it's actually more complicated than that because when she raised the issue with her editor, he actually agreed with her, but then stuck to the style that neither of them liked. Here's the story. Helen has some dialogue in her novel where the characters talk about calling 911. For my foreign listeners, that's the emergency number in the United States. Now, her publisher uses the Chicago Manual of Style, as many book publishers do. That's totally normal. And the general rule in Chicago is that you usually write out numbers in dialogue, even when you might use the numerals in narrative text. For example, in Chicago Manual of Style, you write out the words for the numbers 1 through 100, but use the numeral format for most bigger numbers. So you'd use the numerals if you wrote something like, Artvark only needs 2,400 more miles for a free plane ticket. But you'd write out the words for 2,400 in dialogue if you wrote something like this. Squiggly said, quote, Artvark can be kind of obsessive. He once counted all his change by laying out 2,400 pennies in a row on the table. Unquote. So following this style, Helen's copy editor changed her manuscript, so the phone number 911 was spelled out. He should call 911 with the words 911. Helen thought this looked ridiculous, and her editor actually agreed, but then said there was nothing he could do about it because the publisher follows Chicago style. When Helen and I talked about it at lunch, I thought the whole situation was ridiculous. The first lesson I want you to learn is that you never have to slavishly follow a style guide when your common sense tells you what you're writing should be different. Often, there are situations that aren't specifically covered by a style guide, and you should make your own judgment about what's best, maybe guided by similar rules that are covered by the style guide, but you should never feel like you have to force your work into something awkward just so it, quote, fits the rules. Trust me, the editors of the style guides would want you to use common sense, not to do something awkward just so you're following their style. 
Second, if people tell you something about a rule and it doesn't sound right to you, don't take their word for it. Look it up. Because after lunch, I went home and looked through the Chicago Manual of Style and found a specific exception for phone numbers in dialogue. Chicago doesn't say the words use numerals for phone numbers in dialogue. But in section 1344, titled Numerals in Direct Discourse, it says the practice of writing out words for numbers in dialogue, quote, requires editorial discretion, unquote, and gives the example that you can usually use numerals when you're writing a year. You don't have to write out the words for 2019. And then the entry had five example sentences, and one of them is a line of dialogue with a phone number written with the numerals and not the words, making it very clear that phone numbers are an exception to the the write-out-all-the-numbers-as-words-in-dialogue rule. So, of course, I emailed Helen right away so she could pass the information on to her editor. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing the editor was either following the rules from an imperfect memory or using an older version of the Chicago Manual of Style that didn't talk about editorial discretion and give a phone number as an example of an exception. It's one argument for always having the newest edition of your style guide if you're a professional editor or writer, and for always looking things up when there's a conflict, even if you think you know the rules. And finally, if you're a professional writer or editor, remember that style guides are there to help you be consistent, to help you be a better writer, and to help you be clear, but not to force you into doing something awkward just to conform to their particular set of rules. Finally today, I have a Familect story. If you're a longtime listener, see if you can remember the name for the kind of word Julie describes. Hi, my name is Julie. I thoroughly enjoy listening to your podcast, and I wanted to share a family story with you. When my sister was little, she had created her own little language, as a lot of kids do, and most of the words went their way as she got older, but one of them stuck with us. Whenever she would get a cold, she would talk about her snocked up nose, which we assumed was her way of combining stopped up and what it was filled with. But the word just seemed to describe the condition so well that throughout our childhood, all of us would tell about our snocked up noses well after we knew the proper term for it. She is now a mother herself, so I'm sure she gets her fill of wiping and um, blowing little snocked up noses. But that was just a cute little term she came up with that stuck. Thanks so much. Thanks, Julie. Did any of you remember that this kind of word is called a blend or a portmanteau? Because it takes part of two different words and blends them together. Snocked is a blend, just like smog is a combination of smoke and fog, and like spork is a combination of spoon and fork. Thanks again, and remember, if you want to hear your family act story on the show, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, your family dialect, leave a voicemail message at 833214-GIRL. I'm Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sims. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find articles that go with each episode at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.